Today I want to speak to you on the subject of what does the Bible say about the New World Order. Uh, you can imagine with the number of views that we receive and the comments that come in, there are a multitude of questions that revolve around all of the hoopla that is now openly on display in media and world leaders, etc., about this aggressive push towards a globalism, a new world order. And many of you that watch uh, our various channels and social media platforms are curious, does the Bible speak about a new world order? Does Bible prophecy address globalism, etc.? And the short answer to that is yes. But there are three questions in particular that I want to answer in our study today that I believe every serious student, don't miss this, Every serious student of the Bible, and in particular Bible prophecy, you should be able to answer these questions for friends and for loved ones that may ask of you. And so those three questions that we're going to address in this Bible study, number one, how does the Bible describe this world? very important if you are a student of the Bible, if you're a student of Bible prophecy, that you understand that there is a biblical definition of the simple word we often use, world, or the phrase, this world in which we live. The Bible addresses that. Question number two we're going to answer in our study is, does the Bible define a new world order. Question number one, does the Bible describe this world? Question number two, does the Bible define a new world order? And perhaps uh, the most important question for many, and the third question is, does the Bible direct us for this new world order? Has God given us directions? Has God given us counsel? Has God given us advice as believers living in this world with these things already foretold in Bible prophecy, does the Bible direct us for this new world order? Revelation chapter 13, uh, if you have your Bible, if you're a new Christian, Revelation is the last book in the Bible and uh, again, for those of you that are just beginning to learn the scriptures, I so commonly hear, I just heard a well-known minister refer to the book of Revelations, plural. Uh, that's incorrect. It is the book of Revelation, singular. Uh, the book of Revelation is a single revelation that was given to John, who was a follower of Christ, he had been placed upon an isle called Patmos. He was there imprisoned. But while there, the Apostle John received this vision from Jesus Christ that he penned in AD 95 called the Book of Revelation. And if you followed our teaching before, you've heard me teach out of Revelation 13 before concerning the world agendas. The Bible speaks of five very distinct global agendas, political agendas in the last days. And if you're new to the channel, at some point you need to listen to our video or our podcast entitled, The Five Political Agendas of Revelation 13, because that will actually add even more depth to your understanding of our study today. But today we're going to narrow down and place our crosshairs upon the study of what does the Bible say about the new world order. Revelation chapter 13, beginning to read at verse 1. Then I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. And by the way, uh, when you are reading Revelation 13, in verses 1, 2, and 3, the beast is the Antichrist. Put that in your notes. And again, for all new students, always have a Bible, always have a way of taking notes, always have a highlighter so that you can go through and highlight 
some of the classic passages that we're teaching from. But the beast in verses 1, 2, and 3 is describing the Antichrist. And the scripture actually identifies that later. Then I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. It had seven heads and ten horns with ten crowns on its horns. And written on each head were names that blasphemed God. Now, I'm not going to take time to exegete verse by verse as we're going along, but when it describes him as having seven heads, ten horns, ten crowns, this is all referring to a head which in this particular circumstance is identifying levels of authority. And again, we're not going to take the time to teach uh, word by word, time doesn't permit, But just so you'll understand, the first three verses are identifying the Antichrist and are identifying a diversification of levels of authority and governance. And written on each head were names that blasphemed God. This beast looked like a leopard, but it had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion and the dragon. Now, the word dragon in Revelation 13 refers uh, to, and throughout this chapter, as Satan. As a matter of fact, there's a verse a little later that actually says, and that dragon, Satan. And so it's not speculation as to who the dragon is either. The first beast is the Antichrist, and the dragon is Satan. And the dragon gave the beast his own power and throne and great authority. I saw that one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed. The whole world marveled at this miracle. Pause right there and highlight the whole world. Because as we study Bible prophecy, globalism is identified repeatedly throughout both the book of Daniel and here the last book in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, globalism, one world order, is surely found in Bible prophecy. Let's read on. The whole world marveled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. Very important. Highlight that. The whole world marveled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. Now we've already defined that the beast is the Antichrist, and now the Bible tells us the whole world gives allegiance. The whole world. Uh, Globalism. New world order. Allegiance to a one world leader. A one world government. A one world economy a one-world military power, a one-world religion. All of these things are clearly prophesied in the book of Revelation and identified and initiated here in Revelation 13. Verse 4, They worshipped the dragon for giving the beast such power. Pause again. It is Satan who is giving demonic power to this political world leader. I don't want to offend you, but politics are not the hope and certainly don't have the answers. Politics in Bible prophecy escalate in levels of demonic activity and corruption and perversion that will be a part of causing people to hunger for a new world order. And so Christians that I often meet who put such an emphasis upon politics and parties and and world leaders and, and my senator and my president and my party, friends, those are all things of the world that are corrupted. And our hope is not in the White House. Our hope is in the church house. And we must always remember this. This political agenda that we're seeing in the world becoming more and more perverse, it's a part of prophetic, biblical speculation? No. It is clearly, prophetically, and clearly addressed. 
the political systems of this world are inspired by Satan behind the scenes. And so it will be with the arrival of the Antichrist. They worshiped the dragon for giving the beast such power, and they also worshiped the beast. Who is as great as the beast, they exclaimed, who is able to fight against him? Then the beast was allowed to speak great blasphemies against God, and he was given authority to do whatever he wanted for 42 months. Imagine that. A one-world leader with a one-world government initiating a one-world economy, a one-world religion, a one-world military power that will enforce his barbaric mandates, and no one can stop him. No one has the power to overrule him. He was given authority to do whatever he wanted for 42 months. And he spoke terrible words of blasphemy against God, slandering his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And he was given authority to rule over every tribe and people and language and nation. There is another descriptive reinforcement if you wonder if there's going to be a new world order. There's no way around that. The Bible said every tribe, all people, every language, every nation, verse 8, and all the people who belong to this world worshipped the beast. They are the ones whose names were not written in the book of life before the world was made. The book that belongs to the Lamb who was slaughtered. This, of course, speaks of Christ. Verse 9, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. And so I'm politely asking you today, will you take time today to listen? And I'll do my best to help you to understand what does the Bible say about the new world order? Just before we get into the three questions and answering them for you, let's take a moment to pray together. Heavenly Father, once again, as we open up the Holy Bible, we humble our hearts before you and before the audience of people that will come across this and will learn what the Scripture says in Bible prophecy about this particular end-time scenario. I pray, Father, that by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you'll guide us into all truth. I ask for your strength and for your quickening, both in body, mind, and spirit, and enable me to communicate the words and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And we give you praise. I pray specifically, Lord, for those who may come across this study and maybe in their heart they don't know exactly where they stand with God. Maybe no one has ever told them that God loves them and that when Christ died upon the cross and shed his blood, it was for all sinners. May they know today that there's no sin in their past greater than the mercies of God. And I praise you for the promise of the Bible that tells us, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so if they're not certain as to where they stand with God, when we pray the sinner's prayer at the end of our time together, give them the faith and the courage and the humility to do what they ought to do. Let today be their hour of decision where they turn from sin and turn to Christ by faith in you alone. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, uh, Amen. One of the things that I want you to know is that nowhere in the Bible will you ever find the phrase, regardless of what translation or at least modern accurate translation of the Bible you may own, you will never find the phrase new world order or one world government. But you will see it, as we just read in Revelation 13, you will see that the scripture clearly tells us 
that it will be a new world order. The Bible clearly defines for us that there's coming a one world government. And again, if you've not already heard our teaching on the five political agendas of Bible prophecy, you need to listen to that study. It will add great depth to details that I don't have the time to cover today. But as I've already mentioned, Revelation 13 is the very first time in the Bible where the five political agendas of the last days are clearly defined. Revelation 13 reveals not only those five political agendas of the last days, it reveals what we oftentimes refer to as the unholy trinity. Because in Revelation 13, the Bible reveals the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the dragon, which is Satan. That is the unholy trinity, and they are the key players in the five political agendas. Again, if you're taking notes, the Bible prophesied in Revelation 13, a one-world leader, a one-world government, a one-world monetary system, a one-world religion, and a one-world military power who will enforce the brutal and barbaric mandates of this one-world leader, the Antichrist. Listen to that study when you have a time. But for today, let's get into answering just these three questions. For many years, the media and those who control the narratives behind the curtains have tried to convince us that anyone talking about a new world order was simply someone trying to propagate a conspiracy and uh, they were extremists. That was what was said for many, many years. Much of my childhood and much of my life growing up, that is what was said. Anybody talking about a new world order, a one world government, or an antichrist, or a one world leader, these people are just extremists and can't be trusted. But no longer. The last several years, we have seen an increasing boldness throughout the media and presidents and world leaders and world luminaries not only talking about a one world government, not only calling for globalism, not only openly talking about and using the phrase a new world order, it is now on a repeat cycle and a bullet point on news on a regular basis. Question number one, if you're taking notes, write it down. Question number one, does the Bible describe this world? And it does. How does the Bible describe this world? When we read of the world in the New Testament, we are reading a word that when you render it from the original Greek manuscript, that word is cosmos, which is where we get the word cosmopolitan. But the Greek word is cosmos, rendered in the Bible, and it refers to the inhabited world, it refers to the people who live in this earth, which function apart from God. And that's something that I want you to understand as a student of the Bible. This world is the enemy of God. In fact, there are scriptures written by the Apostle Paul that tell us that to be friends with the world, cosmos, is to be the enemy of God. This world is the enemy of your faith, and your flesh is the enemy of your faith. And there are many things in this world that if you're biblically literate, you understand these are not friends, these are foes when it comes to our spiritual life and our spiritual health. And the scripture tells us that this world, this cosmos, is controlled by Satan. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me take the time, uh, go into the Bible, into the book of John with me in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and uh, go over to the, uh, I believe it's the 12th chapter, 
and go down to verse uh, 30 and verse 31. John chapter 12, verse 30 and 31, Jesus actually told us that Satan is the ruler of the cosmos, this world. Uh, John chapter 12, verse 30, then Jesus told them, the voice was for your benefit, not mine. The time for judging this world, cosmos in the Greek, has come. When Satan, the ruler of this world, cosmos once again in the Greek, will be cast out. Notice that Jesus, all the way back in his ministry upon this earth, in his teaching made it clear to all of his followers that we have a cosmos, a world that we live in as believers, as followers of Christ, but the world is not our ally because the world is under the demonic influence of Satan and demonic hordes. Jesus told us that this world refers to more than just a planet in the solar system. Jesus described this world, this cosmos, as a world system controlled by Satan. And thus, you should better understand that the current world that you and I live in right now is dominated by sin, dominated by perversion, dominated by wickedness, dominated by twisted ideologies. Our education has gone off the rails and is literally a textbook from the very pit of hell, what is being brought into the classrooms and told to our children and grandchildren today is no longer hidden. This world is under demonic influence, and don't miss this, the closer we get to the rapture of the church, which is the next major prophetic event on the calendar of God, there is an escalation that the Bible prophesies about this world and its perversion and its wickedness. So if you've wondered why, and maybe you don't consider yourself a follower of Christ, maybe you're an individual who is not a Bible believer, maybe you're just listening and you're uh, just being entertained by people like myself who open a Bible, but you're now starting to get a little more curious because the things that the Bible had prophesied and things that are written in the Bible are now pretty hard to avoid. You would have to be living off-grid in a cave not to see that the wickedness of this world system is aggravated and angry and is escalating. Why? Because we are getting ready for the soon return of the Lord by means of rapture. And the closer we get to the rapture, the frustration of Satan, because he's held back by the power of the church, that is the restraining power right now in the world today, is the body of Christ and the authority of the church. Jesus prophesied about that in Matthew 16. I will build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. And so while the church is in the world and Christ is the great shepherd of the church and we are a part of the body if we've repented of sin and received Christ, we have a safe haven in the covenant of the church. But when the church is raptured and the church is removed and the world will then enter into what the scripture defines as seven years of tribulation, there will be no restraining power. And the world system that Jesus described and told us was controlled and manipulated by Satan, all gloves will be off, and you cannot even imagine the apocalyptic horror that awaits this world in the coming seven years. And I repeat to you once again, it will be under the reign of politicians and political agendas, and ultimately to the stage front and center, a politician by the name in the scripture, the Antichrist. Now obviously you'll never see a politician with a sign, uh, this November please elect John P. Antichrist, that's not his literal name, but the Bible describes him as 
the Antichrist. Question number two, does the Bible define a new world order? Does the Bible define a new world order? Well, as I mentioned earlier, for many years, those who controlled the narrative uh, tried to convince us that this was just conspiracy talk, it was just extremist, it was just radical evangelicals, and so on, but no longer. There is not even the slightest attempt to try to hide this new world order and its globalistic agenda. It is unashamedly out in the open and the media almost on a daily basis, and I don't watch a whole lot of news, but every time I'm around a television set or walking through an airport, it just seems like I continually hear the bullet points that the Bible prophesied about constantly being referred to both by the media, by world leaders, by luminaries in high places, even religious leaders in high places are sharing the urgency of nations that need to unite and global alliances and new world orders. And they actually use those terms. And quite frankly, it's not new. Those of us that live in America, you'll remember a president by the name of George Bush Sr. Uh, both he and then later his son served in the office of the presidency of the United States of America. George Bush Sr. had been the former director of the CIA. He was perhaps the first president who boldly and consistently had speeches that advocated that America needed to lead the way in a new world order. I actually had a clip of George Bush uh, Sr. as president advocating the new world order and telling us that America should lead the way. I was going to play that clip for you, but uh, there were some questions as to uh, copyright and I didn't want to break the law. But if you want to Google it on your own, Google George W. Bush Sr. advocating the New World Order, and there will be plenty of material there. I am not making this up. All the way back then, America and American citizens were being groomed for a New World Order. David Rockefeller said this, quote, We are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crises, and the nations will willingly accept the new world order. End of quote. And even the Roman Catholic Church, several popes, are, and the current pope, have not only embraced it, they are leaders who are pushing it. Pope John Paul II called for a new international order to replace the one that emerged from the Second World War. He said this, direct quote from Pope John Paul II, quote, the new world order would be able to provide solutions to the problems of today based on the dignity of human beings an integrated development of society, solidarity between rich and poor nations, and the sharing of resources and the extraordinary results of scientific and technological progress. End of quote. And they all do the same thing. They present to the populace this ideology of a new world order with all of these glowing benefits of accepting what we know from the Bible was prophesied as the final bridge to the tribulation time. Our current president, President Joe Biden, recently stated, and I quote, America must lead in the new world order, end of quote. Now we all know he's simply reading the narratives that are written for him, and he's not in control any more than any other world leader is control. There is, and this is not conspiracy, there is a power behind the curtains unseen 
The Bible prophesied it in Revelation 13 all the way back in AD 95 to let us know that whoever world leaders are, whoever presidents are, whoever is leading a nation, whoever is the current world lumen, you name it, across the board, they are all puppets of a demonic and prophetic biblical agenda that will com culminate in the seven-year tribulation time. The book of Revelation and the Old Testament book of Daniel both describe some type of world governance system and both agree it will be controlled by a demonically elected global leader, again, that is defined as the Antichrist. Uh, John, the author of the book of Revelation, described the ruler of this new world as having power and great authority and reinforced what I've been telling you, that this power is demonic. This power is given to him uh, by Satan. Uh, go back to our text in Revelation and the 13th chapter, if you don't have this highlighted in your Bible, uh, let me take the time to turn to it, read it to you, and give you an opportunity uh, to highlight it. Revelation and the 13th chapter go down to verse 2. Revelation 13, verse 2. This beast looked like a leopard, but it had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, now remember, the dragon in the book of Revelation defined it, the 13th chapter always refers to Satan. The dragon gave the beast his own power and throne and great authority. Highlight that. Satan, the dragon, gave the beast his power, his throne, and great authority. The Bible goes on to tell us in the book of Revelation in the 13th chapter, that this Antichrist will receive global worship from all the world, Revelation 13 and verse 4. And then the Bible tells us he'll have authority over every tribe, every people, every language, every nation, Revelation 13 and verse 7. So there is no debate if you believe the Bible to be the Word of God. There is a world order, new world order, prophesied all the way back in AD 95, and we are now openly being pitched to sail for this coming global alliance. The Bible doesn't leave any room for debate. You know, many times when I listen to some teachers and preachers and professors and those who call themselves biblical theologians, uh, it's amazing how they'll take things that are in the Scripture that are not clear and try to force it as being a strong belief. And they'll oftentimes say, this was reinforced to me by God in a dream that I had. You know, I just recently, as a matter of fact, today, I had one of the individuals that's been saved through our ministry, follows us on YouTube and listens to the podcast channel, etc., ask me a question. And when they emailed me the question, the question was, I had a dream. And in my dream, it seemed as if God was speaking to me about thus and thus. And I'll not tell you what the dream was. But as a new believer, she said, how should I interpret my dreams? How do I know what God is trying to tell me in my dreams? Well, we know from the Bible that God does use dreams. God can speak to us through dreams. But Joel the prophet said these things that are spiritually sometimes given through dreams. Don't miss what I'm about to say. Your dreams should be held in weight in your spirit and allow God to confirm whether it's a dream from Him or whether you just had too much pepperoni on your pizza before you went to bed. Because there are a lot of people who abuse spiritual dreams and give classes. You know, this color means this, and then this animal means this. And it's a bunch of hogwash. If God gives you a dream by the Holy Spirit, 
Tuck that dream in your heart. And if that dream is from God, he'll make clear to you what the interpretation is. But here it is, gold standard, don't miss it. It's the Bible and the Bible alone that guides us in life, not dreams, not personal revelations, not what somebody who claimed to be a prophet, and I don't dishonor the office of the prophet. I believe in prophetic gifts. I believe in the five gifts of Ephesians 4, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. I am not uh, defaming any of those, but I am telling you the Bible said in the last days that we would witness a, an increase of false prophets, and social media is full of false prophets. And I can tell by the words of what many of them are declaring that they're false prophets because they're out of alignment with this sacred book. The Bible and the Bible above all is your compass that guides you. What the scripture says is above every dream, above every revelation. Any man or woman of God that says, I know the Bible said this, but God showed me personally, stay away from that person. Run and don't turn back. The Bible is the compass that will never, never fail you. That's why I say the Bible leaves no room for debate. The Antichrist will be a one world leader of a new world order. And under the deception of climate change. You see, when you understand Bible prophecy and you understand what the scripture defined would be upon the world, when you understand that message that I've encouraged you to listen to, the five political agendas of Bible prophecy, you begin to see things through the lens of the scripture and you'll not be deceived and you'll not be fooled. There is no climate crisis. How do you know that? The Bible said in Genesis that the God who created the heavens and the earth, the earth and the seasons, he said, as long as time remains, there will be spring, there will be summer, there will be fall, there will be winter. Man does not have the ability to create a crisis in climate. God is in charge of planet earth above all who walk on it. And the creation is not in charge of the creator. The creator, almighty God, has the whole world in his hands. Now, are there problems in climate? Are there changes in weather? Of course, I'm not denying that. But I am telling you that under the deception of combating climate change, we are witnessing the world willingly give up their national sovereignty to combat climate change. And I'm watching many of these political issues that are being pushed and constantly the narrative is developed and shoved down our throat in newscast after newscast. And what's happening? We're watching the leaders of the world and the nations of the world willingly give up the sovereignty of their nations to these false crises that are being created by demonic political agendas. And I see it for what it is. It is the beginning of nations willingly giving up sovereignty because when the Antichrist arises, they will all willingly and gladly receive the new world order. To truly control people, Commerce must be controlled. Let me say that again because that's something some people I don't think understand the weight of it. To truly control people, you have to truly control commerce. That's why in Revelation 13, the Antichrist is going to control commerce. He's going to control the economy and the backbone of the economy. The Bible says that people will be forced to receive a mark and without the mark, no one will be able to buy or sell. In controlling commerce, he controls the populace. Uh, Mayor Amschel Rothschild said this, and I quote, let me issue and control a nation's money and I care not who writes the laws, end quote. 
And Revelation 13 describes how this is going to happen. The Bible said that everyone, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, will be forced to receive some type of mark on their right hands or on their forehead, and they won't be able to buy or sell without it. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 16. And we're already witnessing nations suffering under hyperinflation, under economic instability, and volatile markets. There are those who are already forecasting that cash as we know it is ending in the months ahead. There's a crisis over the elimination of national currencies. The American dollar is under attack. The advantages of moving to digital currency and cashless society are the talk of the day. But it was prophesied in A.D. 95 by John who received a vision from Christ that we hold in our hands as the book of Revelation. And all of these crises, I believe many of them are purposeful. I believe many of them are orchestrated and planned. But these crises that we are witnessing in the world today, one after another, add to the appeal of a world savior. It preps the minds of, of ignorant population to welcome a new world order and what it may have to offer. Because the new world offer will be global peace. They'll speak of promises that will free the world of wars and political strife. They'll promise to eradicate poverty and disease and hunger. They'll keep telling us that a new world order will meet the needs and the hopes of all mankind through the illusion of what they're going to offer as peace. But the Bible tells us there will be no peace until the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, sets up His eternal kingdom. But the Bible, again, if you're a new student of the Scripture, you have to answer to your intellect. You can't throw the Bible away because its prophetic content is so accurate. It's history written before it takes place. Now, you may turn your head to that fact. But if you're going to intellectually learn the Bible, you're going to find that the Bible is provable, that the Bible has a backbone of historicity, that the manuscripts and the content of the Scripture are provable. You don't have to throw your brain away to be a born-again believer. And the Bible remarkably foretold these exact modern bullet points thousands of years ago in perfect detail. Lastly, and we close, question number three, does the Bible direct us for this new world order? As believers, does the Bible direct us? Does the Bible give us direction, counsel, advice, knowing these things are going to happen? Now, they are not going to be in total operational mode until after the rapture. But make no mistake, as I'm sharing this with you, you and I both know we have been watching for years the stage of this agenda is being set. The curtains will soon be drawn. The new world order is ready to launch. It's the church that holds it back. Paul, in writing to the church in Thessalonica and also writing to the church at Corinth, told them of the authority of the church. In one passage, he said, it's the restraining power that keeps the Antichrist from being revealed. But when the church is raptured and the church is removed, the restraining power of prophecy will be eliminated and literally all hell will break loose. But as believers in this world, you have to remember this. Don't miss this. We live in this world, but we are not of this world. Uh, take your Bible and go with me into uh, the New Testament book of Philippians and the third chapter. Philippians and the third chapter and go down to verse uh, 17. Philippians chapter 3, verses 17, and I'm going to read down through verse 21. Listen very carefully. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. 
For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ, and they are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. There's that word cosmos in the Greek again. But we, believers, don't miss this, highlight this verse, verse 20. We, believers, are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. You and I as followers of Christ and believers in the content of divine scripture, we live in this world, but we are not of this world. Our citizenship was transferred the moment that we turn from sin and turn to Christ. And Paul's writing that to these young believers. In verse 20 he said, But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for Him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like His own, using the same power with which He will bring everything under His control. I close with this and repeat it one more time. As long as the church is present on this earth, the power and the authority and the glory of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ will be a restraining power that holds back the plans of Satan and the new world order of revelation will never be released until after the rapture of the church. So as believers, we must not allow our lives to sink into the fear and the false hopes of the new world order. This is my summation. Don't miss it. If you're a believer, you cannot live in fear. You should not live in fear. The Bible said be anxious about nothing. And so knowing that your heart is right with God, and if you don't know if your heart is right with God, or some people say, I, I used to be a Christian, but I let the cares of this world, and I took a left turn, or this happened in life, and many have forsaken Christ and turned to the world. I'm going to pray with you in just a moment, and today you can make peace with God. If you're away from God, you can come back home today. God loves you. He hates the sin that's destroying you, but He loves you. And you can come back home today, and we're going to pray. But how do we live as these things escalate? Because if you have no hope, you can understand why the Bible says things will be so bad on this earth, cosmos, that men's hearts will fail them for fear. They have no hope. But as believers, we must never live in fear and worry and anxiety and discouragement and depression because of this coming new world order. For we have the hope of heaven and the peace of knowing God is in control in our lives, in our situation, and He takes good care of His children. The one hope for all believers lies only in heaven. It is not in this earth. Before we pray, let me read just one more passage of Scripture in the book of Revelation, all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. The 21st chapter, as this vision is coming to its closing statements, Revelation chapter 21, go down to verse 1 and let me read these eight verses that I hope will stir your faith and encourage your heart. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And the sea was also gone, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among His people. He will live with them, and they will be His people. God Himself will be with them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow, or crying, or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha 
am the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur, and this is the second death. Wouldn't you like to be able to lay your head to the pillow tonight and know that in this chaotic world with all that's going on, all your worries, all your concerns, all your situations, you can lay them at the feet of your Heavenly Father and He'll take good care of you. Do you have peace with God? Do you have a clear, distinct memory of a time in your life when you've prayed and addressed the Holy God, repented of your sin, Ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. You can do that right now. Jesus said, I am the way, John 14 and verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. Will you pray with me? By faith. And when we're done praying, go to our website. It'll be on the screen, lostlamb.org, and click on New Beginnings. And I've prepared a series of teachings to help you as you're coming to faith in Christ. Do that right now. Pray with me. Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, I believe you were speaking to me. And I genuinely want to live ready to meet the Lord. I genuinely want to know that my sins and my past are forgiven and forgotten. And I genuinely want to know that my heart is right with God and that I have peace with you. And so today I recognize my sin and I repent of my sin and I receive your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior who died on the cross and shed His blood to wash me and purify me and make me holy. In childlike faith, I place my life in the hands of the Lord. Forgive me. Be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, I vow I will serve you all the days of my life. And thank you for the promise of the Bible. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today, in Jesus' name, I'm saved. And I'll never be the same. Amen. Come in to stay, come in to my heart, Lord Jesus.